This is Workers' Comp Matters, hosted by attorney Alan S. Pierce, the only legal talk network program that focuses entirely on the people and the law in workers' compensation cases. Nationally recognized trial attorney, expert, and author, Alan S. Pierce is a leader committed to making a difference when workers' comp matters. Welcome to Legal Talk Network and Workers' Comp Matters. My name is Alan Pierce. I'm an attorney at Pierce, Pierce and Napolitano in Salem. And we're bringing you another edition of Workers' Comp Matters with two guests, Justin Beck. Justin is a recent graduate of the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. He is currently studying for the Pennsylvania Bar Exam. He's working as a law clerk at Thomas Thomas and Hafer, LLP, and he also is an academic research assistant to Judge David B. Torrey. He's a former intern at the Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry and former law clerk at Quatrini Rafferty PC in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. And uh, speaking of Quatrini Rafferty, our other guest on line with us is Vincent Quatrini of the Quatrini Rafferty Law Firm. Vince is a founding partner, managing partner, concentrates his practice in the area of workers' compensation and the representation of injured workers has more than 40 years of experience and has, in looking at his resume, has done everything possible in leading the bar and his colleagues as probably one of the foremost practitioners and teachers and scholars of workers' compensation in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We're going to be discussing a landmark case involving Frank Palowski and an essay that Justin wrote about this case, which is now 30 years old. So before we do that, first of all, I'd like to welcome Justin and Vince, who are speaking to us from Pennsylvania. Hi, guys. Hey, Alan. Hello. Thanks so much for having us. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our great sponsors, one of whom is Case Pacer. Case Pacer is a practice management software system dedicated to the busy trial attorneys. Uh, to learn more, go to casepacer.com. And our other sponsor is PI Now. They are qualified private investigators. You can find a local qualified private investigator anywhere in the country by visiting PINow.com to learn more. So, Justin, I'd like to start with you because sitting on my table in front of me is an essay that you wrote. It uh, has a logo of the Rolling Rock Extra Pale Beer product that uh, presumably is still manufactured in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. And the title of your essay is From the Glass-Lined Tanks of Old Latrobe, 30 Years of Pulaski. So tell me, what is it about the Frank Pulaski case that led you to commemorate 30 years of the landmark decision that came down uh, from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court? Well, it's kind of interesting. Um, of course, the case itself, uh, decided in 1987, still has major impact on Pennsylvania practice today. But, in fact, my personal connection to the case came many years ago. I grew up in Latrobe myself, and uh, Vince is actually my cousin, so I knew him growing up. And one of the interesting things is that growing up, uh, I always knew Vince was an attorney, but there was a mystique on, well, you know, why, um, what does he do exactly, and how did he get to where he is? And as I got into law school and I started uh, learning uh, and moving towards the area of workers' compensation myself, finding it uh, so interesting, it occurred to me that this case was his defining accomplishment, really, in 1987. And so I started looking at it a little closer and figuring out exactly what happened in the case, and it dawned on me that the 30th anniversary was coming up. And so I thought that it was a perfect opportunity to kind of recount what happened and the lasting legacy of the case itself. Great. And, and as, as we're going to hear in a moment, the import of the Palowski case was bringing together the concept of occupational illness or occupational disease into the workers' compensation realm, which up until the Palowski case in Pennsylvania and in most jurisdictions personal injury was something different than an occupational disease or an occupational injury. So, Vincent, you were probably as new to the workers' comp system when you got involved in Mr. Pulaski's case many years ago than Justin is today. 
So when, from your perspective, tell us what happened to Mr. Polovsky that led to this decision that finally clarified the law. Thank you. So, as you pointed out, I was only a few years out of law school when I had the opportunity to meet Mr. Polowski through my mentor, Morrison Lewis, an older practitioner who had filed the claim and handled the first hearing and said, here, you run with this. And naivete is a wonderful quality uh, because it it shields you from not taking chances, right? So you, you figure that uh, this gentleman who cleaned the beer vats at the Lake Row Brewing Company where they made Rolling Rock, he would use strong chemicals to clean the vats. He would be inside the vats, and over time... He, his breathing got worse. He came to the job with asthma, but that asthma was controlled and he worked with it. But now, over the course of time, these chemicals aggravated his asthma to the point where he could not work anymore. And so, with my new legal eyes, I thought, well, this must be a worker's comp injury. He's at work. The atmosphere conditions at work caused his problem to render him unable to work. He should get a weekly check. And so that's uh, the basis on which the claim was filed, and we began to litigate it, Alan. Okay. And it didn't go well initially for him. Correct. Tell us why. Well, in Pennsylvania... Uh, as you point out, as in many jurisdictions, they had a specific set of occupational diseases that you could qualify under, black lung, asbestosis, bisonosis, and then you had your injury claims. Well, mine was somewhere between the two. This was not an occupational disease, it was a worsening of a pre-existing condition. And so the referee, following precedent in Pennsylvania, concluded that I had not met my burden under the occupational disease provisions, nor had I met my burden under the injury provision of the act. And he denied the claim. Right. And in reading the summary in Justin's essay regarding the denial of the claim, I don't think it was disputed that his work played a significant role in rendering him disabled by aggravating the asthma. It's that whatever happened to him didn't fit into the two categories that would allow recovery, occupational disease or personal injury. Is that kind of their rationale? Exactly. What I always appreciated about the judge before whom I appeared was that he laid the case out that way. His sympathies were with Mr. Pulowski, but the law was not with Mr. Pulowski. So the referee, Floyd Warren, laid out facts that later on appeal made it easier for the higher court to find in our favor because of what you just said, Alan, that the, there was no question that the work is what aggravated his problem. It's just that the law didn't conform. Right. And, you know, those of us, myself included, that have been practicing workers' comp, uh, like you, Vince, I've been doing it uh, over 40 years myself, we've seen significant developments even in the last 40 years, never mind the first 60 years of workers' comp. So I, this brings me to something that Justin spent some time talking about in his essay, and that's something we've talked about here on this show in the past. That's the 1972 National Commission Report. The National Commission was a, a study group appointed by President Nixon to, to study workers' comp. It was led by Professor John Burton. And Justin, tell us what it was that came out of the federal government's commission on workers' comp that paved the way for the appellate courts and the Supreme Court in Pennsylvania to find a way to compensate people like Mr. Pulowski. 
Well, the 1972 commission report, uh, of course, was a federal report, and it made, I believe, 18 essential recommendations to state comp systems. And they threatened that if these were not adopted um, amongst the states, that there would be the potential for federalization of workers' compensation. So one of those recommendations was full coverage of work-related diseases similar to that provided for work-related accidents and injuries. Now, interestingly enough, Pennsylvania had, um, we always refer to the 1972 amendments here in Pennsylvania, and these ideas were not new in the commission report because the 1972 Pennsylvania amendments actually predated the publishing of those formal national recommendations. And and this is where Pulaski really, yes, Frank Pulaski filed his claim petition in 1977, but the change in the law began in 1972, and those 1972 amendments actually changed the term of the compensable event recognized here in Pennsylvania from accident to injury. And in doing so, it removed a statutory requirement of what they required as violence to the physical structure of the body. And so in that way, it became decades of figuring out, well, what does injury mean? Now that we've changed the term, what connotation does that have and, and what effect does that have on compensability in the state? And around the same time, in trying to struggle with the definition of injury, we were seeing a lot of these cases in the uh, arena of people who suffered psychological or psychiatric trauma in the workplace. And many jurisdictions did not recognize a psychological or psychiatric diagnosis or trauma as being an injury uh, as defined in their local workers' comp, and it certainly isn't an occupational disease. So a lot of what maybe what Pawlowski stood for also was beneficial to those of us when there are other types of clearly work-related conditions that just don't neatly fit into the definition of personal injury or accident. Right. It's true, but interestingly enough, on that point, in Pennsylvania, to this day, certain mental injuries require a higher burden to show an abnormal work event when it is a um, mental cause and a mental injury, whereas Pulaski, for all other injuries, there's a quote from the case itself that says, we now hold that uh, an employer takes his employee as he finds him, a thin skull, a straw doctrine. But the, the only remnant of higher burdens um, for specific uh, elements in Pennsylvania is still this mental, mental injury uh, that has a different standard of uh, a different burden of proof than the rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, I'd like to get into burden of proof and causation standards uh, as it might apply to a Pawlowski type situation now. So, Vincent, we kind of left it off with you that it was denied by the referee, which I guess is what passes for either a hearing officer, a commissioner, or an administrative judge in different jurisdictions. I think you no longer refer to them as referees in Pennsylvania. What was the appellate course, just very quickly, from that point of denial, even though the judge or the referee gave you some helpful language? The second step in Pennsylvania is what is described as the Workers' Comp Appeal Board. So you're still in the administrative structure of the Pennsylvania Department of Labor, they also denied the claim. They affirmed the referee's denial. They cited a case that was my nemesis at the time called Plastile. And in Plastile, the court had created a fiction that they called disease-like, and I won't try to explain that in our limited time, but again, back to my naivete, I kept saying, well, there, what is disease-like? It's either a disease or it isn't a disease. And they also held that under this one provision of the act, I didn't show there was a greater incidence of this kind of problem in the beer industry than in the general public. So I uh, struck out for the second time. The next step in Pennsylvania is the Commonwealth Court. And so now in 1984, about seven years after beginning the process, we were in front of the Commonwealth Court, Alan. Mm -hmm. 
And is that uh, like the Superior Court trial court, or is that an appellate body uh, with more than one judge or justice? It is an appellate body. So you leave the administrative system, go over to the Pennsylvania appellate courts, starting at the Commonwealth Court. Typically, seven judges, or in many other jurisdictions, they have panels. So three judges will hear a case. But if it goes court en banc, that means all seven. And uh, we argued the case in front of the Commonwealth Court. And the court, although they did not identify which specific provision of the act I had proven my case under, they overturned the decision of the judge and uh, the appeal court. And at its core, the Commonwealth Court was establishing the idea that any work-related harm is compensable. So that was a break from legal precedent and tradition, at least insofar as asthma cases or things like that, correct? Exactly. Aggravations were not recognized prior to this. And so now the next step, the insurance company and the employer then appealed to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Now, is, at that level, is it discretionary with the Supreme Court to take it, or is it an, um, an automatic appeal if they file it? It is discretionary. You file a petition for allowance, and uh, the court, as uh, our colleagues across the nation, would recognize only a handful of cases are accepted to the Supreme Court. And I would assume the Supreme Court, in making a decision whether to accept a case for a discretionary appellate review, really looks at how much of a change or novel decision that they're going to write so that uh, it's usually a sign that uh, this is a case of sufficient import not only to Mr. Pawlowski and his family, but to other people. And the Supreme Court upheld the decision, as I understand it. It did, and the uh, part of the backstory of that stage is that we, my uh, colleague uh, Roy Walters, who represented uh, Rolling Rock, and I argued the case in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in front of the court en banc, uh, Supreme Court, again, being seven judges, uh, Pennsylvania, and no decision came down for over a year. And we had all kind of theories uh, running as to why. But then a year later, out of nowhere, they rescheduled the case for argument in Philadelphia, PA, across the state, And we went down there to conduct a second argument in front of the same panel of judges. And how long did you have to wait for that decision? It was, again, months. Uh, So uh, here's Frank Pulowski, you know, uh, on his almost 10-year saga. And I keep telling him, you know, well, maybe, you know, we'll hear it now, maybe. (laughs) And so it went on for at least, I think, 16, 17 months from the first argument. And so the decision came down in 1987, May of 1987, uh, again noting that we left the Commonwealth Court in 1984. At this point, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we will continue the saga of Frank Pawlowski and the impact of the Pawlowski decision, not only in Pennsylvania, but in other states that have wrestled with the same concepts. So we'll be right back. Case Pacer is the leading practice management software for today's workers' comp and plaintiff's attorney. Named one of the fastest growing companies in America by Inc. Magazine, we've given attorneys and their staff the ability to work from anywhere on any device. By automating workflows and streamlining non revenue generating tasks, Case Pacer enables firms to grow their practice at minimal cost. To see Case Pacer in action, contact us today at casepacer.com. Does your law firm need an investigator for a background check, civil investigation, or other type of investigation? PINow.com is a -a one-of-a-kind resource for locating investigators anywhere in the U.S. and worldwide. The professionals listed on PI Now understand the legal constraints of an investigation, are up-to-date on the latest technology, and have extensive experience in many types of investigation. 
including workers' compensation and surveillance. Find a pre-screened private investigator today. Visit www.pinow.com. Welcome back to Workers' Comp Matters with Justin Beck and Vince Quattrini talking about Frank Pulaski. Vincent, where we left off was we finally, in 1987, you got the end of a 10-year odyssey for Mr. Pulaski. I'm assuming he went without any compensation benefits during this entire period? Uh, that's right, Alan. Yeah, it was uh, 10 years without income. So he, he got an award of 10 years retroactive benefits. What, did your statute provide interest? He did, and it did provide interest. It provides 10% interest uh, per year. I think it might have been 6% at that point. And can I assume he received ongoing compensation benefits for being permanently disabled? He did, uh, yes. But we eventually, in Pennsylvania, uh, we have the ability to settle out your right to checks back then. Mm -hmm. And so we did reach a lump sum settlement of his claim. And my dear friend, Mr. Plowski, passed away in 1992. Right. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but I'm, uh, I'm very happy. That, you know, I, because I think, you know, there are certain cases, even in my career, that, that you become so intimately involved with your clients and their lives and their financial issues, not to mention their medical issues, that you form a bond or a friendship. And reading through Justin's excellent essay and just knowing what I know about you, Vincent, I'm guessing that you and Mr. Pulaski formed and that family formed a similar bond. Uh, yes, that's so true, Alan. And again, having practiced your entire career, uh, you appreciate the uniqueness of that and the gratification that comes with fighting uphill and coming out uh, victorious at the end. Uh, as we practitioners who represent injured individuals know, there's not much better feeling as a professional. Yeah, and, and Justin, as you have gotten into the field of workers' comp, albeit as a law student and, and now hopefully a, a member of the Pennsylvania Bar and, and a workers' comp attorney, that reward, aside from any other financial remuneration or satisfaction you get from arguing a case or winning a case, that is special. That's what makes the practice of workers' comp law unique among other fields. So, But I want to get back to you, Justin, because you were talking about the causation, the fact that an aggravation of a pre-existing condition is enough to trigger responsibility on the part of the employer, the employer's workers' comp insurance company. So in Pennsylvania, I take it, you merely have to show that you've aggravated pre-existing conditions. I'm familiar with a jurisdiction like Massachusetts and other jurisdictions where the causation standard is a bit tougher for those of us who have the burden of proof. In Massachusetts, if somebody had asthma and they worked cleaning out vats of beer, and were exposed to these type of chemicals and their uh, asthma got worse, we would have to show not just that we aggravated the asthma, but that the work remained a major cause of the asthmatic condition and disability. That's different than Pennsylvania, is it not? It is, and that's why Pennsylvania still to this day stands out. And, and the legacy of Pulaski um, from a legal doctrine perspective we often say here in Pennsylvania that if work is the straw that broke the camel's back, then that's it. It's compensable. And really, that goes back to, Vince. it's funny, Vince was talking about uh, the Plastile case, the 1977 Plastile case being his nemesis during the Pulaski litigation. But in fact, there were some elements of that case helping him because um, at the same time in Plastile, you had a uh, underground coal miner who for 32 years uh, worked in the mines, and then he transferred to a new employer. And it was just mixed dust at that point that turned his pre-existing condition into a totally disabling condition. And the court was, in that sense, moving towards what would ultimately be the Pulaski Doctrine. They didn't get all the way there, but it has its roots there. But yes, in Pennsylvania, we no longer fight really over whether a type of injury is compensable. As long as competent medical proofs show that it is work-related, then we consider it compensable. Okay. And what do you see as the lasting legacy of Pawlowski? The lasting legacy would be that 
as I said, as long as it's work-related, it's compensable. So instead of having to go to court and fight over which section of the statute we can get certain injuries under and whether that piece of the statute finds this particular injury compensable, um, and that was really the statutory legacy of Pulaski, the way we actually litigate in Pennsylvania. Instead of having to go through our what we call Section 108 occupational diseases, even a catch-all provision that we have, Vince alluded to, that you can just show that if it's not listed in our occupational disease section, as long as you show that it has a greater incidence in your industry than the general population, then it's compensable. Even that is no longer necessary. Pulaski allowed the injured worker to go through what we call our general injury provision, uh, which is Section 301C1 of our Act. And that's the legacy for lawyers, uh, for litigation, that the burden was lowered to just show the connection to work. And Vince, following the decision in 1987, was there an uptick in other claims being brought that you had not seen before? Yes. But modestly, funny you should refer to that, Alan, because Roy Walter's main argument to the Supreme Court is a parody of most defense arguments of this. The floodgates uh, are open. The floodgates are open. If Roy said it once, Alan, he said it eight times. (laughs) And in fact, the concept of aggravation evolved slowly. And I've thought about that over the years. uh, Is it a floodgate or is it just simply a recognition of, you know, people having to labor with pre-existing problems that if they didn't do that particular job, they would just keep working. But it was that job that they were doing, whether it was repetitive where their carpal tunnel is aggravated to a point that they need surgery or their lungs are impaired to the point where they can't work, uh, it's still a work injury. And that's uh, my legacy of Pulaski that I hold. And I don't know if this ever came up, but medically, there has been for many years, many decades before Pulaski, a disease entity called Baker's Asthma. Uh And it was named Baker's Asthma because bakers who spent all day inhaling flour and other flower-like materials developed a bronchial condition that was asthma, but was specifically known as Baker's asthma, which would lead one to believe that they would be eligible for workers' comp. But I would guess before Pulaski, even a baker with Baker's asthma would have had trouble getting workers' comp. Excellent point. Yes, the burden of proof, as you and Justin have alluded to, would have been much higher. Uh, Alan, before we close, I I would like to just to publicly acknowledge uh, what a wonderful job Justin did with the story. He spent many hours and did lots of homework to put this wonderful journey together, and I applaud him for that. Yeah. And before I ask Justin to tell our listeners how they might be able to download and read this, unlike law review articles or scholarly, academic, boring case studies. This is punctuated with photographs, with actual copies of the filings. There's one thing that caught my attention was like a little inter-office handwritten memo, Vince, uh, when you started the case. So, you know, a reader, especially somebody who handles cases like this, we're not just reading the, the legal story, but we're getting a picture of both how this impacted the lawyer as well as the client. And Justin, I will echo Uh, Vince, and congratulating you for a unique approach to telling this story. So for our listeners who might want to read it and appreciate it more, how can they get a copy? Well, thank you for the kind words from both of you. If somebody's interested in reading it, um, Judge Dave Torrey has posted it on his um, research website, and that is www.davetorrey.com. Dot info, Dave Torrey, dot info, and it's just right on the left side of the page. You'll see it. All right. Well, again, I want to thank you, Justin, for the work you've done. I want to uh, welcome you to what you will find to be an exciting and rewarding career of workers' compensation practice. And Vincent, as always, keep up the good work for the citizens of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Thank you for both appearing on our show. And for those of you listening, tune in for our next show and go out and make it a day that matters. 
listening. Thanks for listening to Workers' Comp Matters today on the Legal Talk Network, hosted by attorney Alan S. Pierce, where we try to make a difference in workers' comp legal cases for people injured at work. Be sure to listen to other Workers' Comp Matters shows on the Legal Talk Network, your only choice for legal talk.